All right, so Katie, I'm gonna start looping. Uh, I'm, we're gonna let everyone in in a minute and I'll start looping for five minutes. Okay. And then Dr. Dubusky, once I switch decks at seven o'clock, that's your cue to turn your microphone and camera back on. Thank you. No problem.
Hello and welcome to our program, Sublingual Tablet Immunotherapy for the Management of Patients with Allergic Rhinoconjunctivitis, Applying Evidence to Evolving Clinical Practice. I'm Dr. Lawrence Dubusky, Clinical Professor of Medicine, Division of Allergy and Immunology, Department of Internal Medicine, George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences in Washington, DC. In addition to being director of the Immunology Research Institute of New England and immediate past president of Interasthma, the Global Asthma Association and past member of the Board of Regents and past speaker of the House of Delegates from the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology and current treasurer of the American Association of Certified Allergists and Immunologists. It's a great pleasure to welcome you today to our program. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues, Dr. Priya Bansal, President, Department of Allergy and Immunology, Asthma and Allergy Wellness Center in St. Charles, Illinois, and Dr. Justin Grywe, a Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine, Division of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology and Rheumatology at University of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio, and a member of the Bernstein Allergy Group. It's a pleasure to have both of them with us tonight as we'll be discussing issues with regard to sublingual allergen immunotherapy. Here are our disclosures, and you can take a look at my disclosures on top. Uh, Dr. Bonsall's disclosures second, Dr. Grawi's disclosures at the bottom. Please uh, review those disclosures in the context of tonight's continuing medical education program. Our learning objectives are noted here. Describe the role of sublingual immunotherapy tablets in the treatment of patients with allergic rhinoconjunctivitis requiring allergen immunotherapy. It's going to be the major focus of the program. Review the efficacy and safety data supporting the use of sublingual immunotherapy tablets in clinical practice of allergy and immunology. Identify patients who are ideal candidates for sublingual immunotherapy tablets. And discuss barriers to implementation of sublingual immunotherapy tablets and potential strategies to overcome those barriers. We'll now begin with the pretest polling questions. Question number one, how confident are you in the management of patients with allergic rhinitis requiring allergen immunotherapy in your practice? Very confident, confident, neutral, little confidence, or no confidence. So please uh, provide your question, answer, at this time, as we begin the polling process. So we wait for everyone to uh, respond here and we have some folks who have no confidence, some folks who are neutral and uh, not a lot of folks who are very confident, so hopefully you'll be more confident after this program here tonight. So let's go to the next question. Which of the following describes the distribution of allergy immunotherapy patients in your practice? 
all immunotherapy patients in my practice receive subcutaneous immunotherapy or skit? I have some sublingual immunotherapy patients, but most receive skit. The majority of my patients are sublingual immunotherapy patients. So let's see what the typical practice is. Looks like skit is in the lead so far. Give you a few moments to respond to this question. So it appears that Skit takes the lead tonight. Again, we do request that you respond to these polling questions as we want to see what the current practice is in our audience. So we have we have slit coming in a bit here behind our skit responders. That's interesting to see. Okay, let's go to the next question. Which of the following most accurately describes your current use of sublingual immunotherapy in practice? Slit patients in my practice receive slit drops. Slit patients in my practice receive slit tablets. Patients may receive slit drops or tablets, depending on individual factors. I do not use slit in my practice. Looks like do not use is in the lead right now, but waiting other folks to respond, please provide your answers. And we have some drops or tablets showing up now. More drops and tablets showing up, so it looks like some people are using the drops and the tablets in their practice. Let's go to the next question. In the United States, there are four FDA-approved slit tablets, including grass pollen, Timothy, ragweed pollen, five grass pollen, sweet vernal orchard, perennial rye, Timothy, and Kentucky blue, and dust mite. All except which of the following are approved for ages as low as five years? Ragweed, dust mite, ragweed and dust mite. So please provide your answer. All except the following are approved as low as five years. This one doesn't seem to be one people want to respond to. So the, the prevalent response is ragweed and dust mite. You'll hear during the program what the actual answer is to this. So I'm not going to spoil it for you, but uh, you may be surprised uh, by the actual answer based on some recent changes in the labeling uh, of one of these products that you'll hear about uh, based on some recent FDA action. So I think that's important. Pay attention to the program as you hear it. Next, in clinical trials evaluating the short ragweed slit tablet, numerical trends suggested which of the following versus placebo for polysensitized versus monosensitized patients. Lower treatment effect in polysensitized patients versus placebo than monosensitized patients. Equal effects in polysensitized and monosensitized patients versus placebo. Greater treatment effect in polysensitized patients versus placebo than monosensitized patients. So let's see what the answer is here. Well, again, I don't think I want to spoil this by telling you what the actual answer is, but it will be in the program. So please pay attention to what you're going to see in a few moments with regard to the actual display of this study's data. You may be a bit surprised. In two trials that evaluated adverse events at any point after a treatment eruption of greater than or equal to two consecutive days for any reason, treatment emergent adverse events occurred in 29% of patients receiving house dust mite slit tablet and 26% of patients receiving placebo. In what percent of house dust mite slit tablet patients did adverse events include systemic reactions, need for epinephrine, or severe local swelling? Zero percent, 
3%, well, again, you may be surprised by this answer, and you're going to hear the answer when you see the presentation, and it uh, may be surprising to most of you based on the answers uh, provided here uh, to this polling question. So again, pay attention, and you'll see how infrequent these events were with reintroduction of the dust mite slick tablets. So, yeah, pay attention as the presentation goes on. Studies have demonstrated slick tablets can have significant effect and provide long lasting symptom relief for patients. But to achieve a disease modifying effect, data has shown treatment must be continued for a minimal length of hmm, two years, three years, Four years? What time is needed as a minimum length to achieve a long-term effect? Hmm. Prevalent answer here is two years, but again, pay attention to the presentation as you may be surprised how long it takes. And uh, I'll just tell you, two years is not the answer. So it'll be longer than that. Pay attention and you'll see as we show you the actual data. So hopefully these polling questions have helped you get a greater understanding of some of the issues and now will allow you to better focus on some of these issues in terms of how long you need to use immunotherapy, what the minimum age now is for slip tablets of various types and uh, what the efficacy is of monosensitized versus polysensitized subjects. So a lot to learn here, and, and hopefully you'll pick up these answers as you watch uh, the upcoming presentation. So please, now that the polling questions have uh, come to an end, uh, let's move on to the presentation. So we'll get back to you in a few minutes after the presentation is over. Enjoy the presentation. We're going to begin with the role of sublingual tablet immunotherapy or slit tablets in allergen immunotherapy. And to begin our discussion, I will have our panelist, Dr. Bunsell, begin this interesting topic. We know that approximately two to three million Americans have received some type of allergy immunotherapy, and there's about 100 to 200,000 new starts of allergen immunotherapy annually in the US. Typically, we know that there's a duration of three to five years. And during this duration, there's a period of weekly updosing. So this updosing, again, depending on the type of practice or the type of physician that you're with, whether it's allergy or ENT, this could range from 20 to 50 weeks in differing protocols. And then you build yourself up to biweekly and then eventually get to monthly injections. We also know that this can be done via cluster immunotherapy. So the cluster immunotherapy, maybe you come in for two injections. I've seen some practices do three in one sitting and then come the week after. So instead of coming for those three weeks in a row, you're trying to knock out those particular injections in one seating. There's also rapid immunotherapy where you get through two, maybe two and a half, three bottles of immunotherapy, finish it up with some weeklies and then get to monthly. So it doesn't necessarily matter like whether you, um, you're doing this weekly immunotherapy protocol or whether you're doing um, cluster, or whether you're doing rapid, it all involves some type of buildup in order to get to maintenance immunotherapy. And because we are doing something that can cause an allergic reaction, it's really important to do these injections at a healthcare facility because we want to be able to treat anaphylaxis, that severe allergic reaction that can happen um, potentially because we're giving them the allergen that they are allergic to. I love this title. So yes, we have had a love affair with immunotherapy for years. Immunotherapy has been used for over a hundred years we know that it works, right? So we know there's well-documented efficacy, it relieves symptoms, it modifies uh, disease states, and it may prevent some new sensitization and asthma symptoms. So what are some barriers for SCIT and where are some opportunities where we might be able to use SLIT? 
So the largest barrier to skit is the requirement for frequent office visits. So the way that I describe this to my patients, I tell them, this is a marriage, okay? So don't enter the marriage without promising commitment or at least a five-year commitment that you have to commit, which is, you know, so they, they all crack up. They think this is funny. I'm like, yes, you have to be committed. So make sure you come in for those uh, visits, but that creates a barrier. There's also a risk of severe reactions, which patients worry about. One of the other things that I find with the rising insurance deductibles is also cost. So for me, those three have been barriers perhaps for doing subcutaneous immunotherapy. Now, how do we contrast this with SLIT? We can target some of these patients that may be a little bit difficult to treat. Maybe it's a mom who's saying, hey, I can't bring in my child. Also for elderly, you know, same thing. If you're having difficulty getting there, there's issues with COVID with the elderly. So maybe that's another possibility for expansion. Patients who may be pregnant, have asthma, some other type of risk factor, maybe that's an opportunity for somebody with SLIT. Now, obviously we wanna be careful with anybody with um, severe asthma or during an exacerbation, but the fact that they're asthmatic doesn't preclude you from using SLIT. Also some of the patients who are needle averse, there's plenty of people with needle phobia. So if they feel like, hey, I just can't do this, fine. Come on in and get sublingual immunotherapy your age or your health or your location, I do get patients that say that I live just too far. I There's no way that I can come back and forth or my work schedule is such that I can't do it. Or as I mentioned, the economics are such that I can't do it. So these are presentations for where um, trying to do sublingual immunotherapy might be an opportunity to try to expand our practice from traditional subcutaneous immunotherapy to um, to embrace and include sublingual immunotherapy. So a discussion point that I had is what other opportunities does SLIT present to improve care? So I'll let my um, panelists chime in over here and then offer some more thoughts. SLIT's been found to be safe. And I think the safety of SLIT uh, allows some unique opportunities to intervene in people with allergic rhinitis and uh, coexistent asthma. And there is a, a growing body of data showing that uh, slit tablets, at least, uh, can be used safely in asthmatics, even though currently the labeling of these tablets is such that they are only from mild to moderate asthma. We are seeing more literature come out showing that in moderate asthma and even greater than moderate asthma, slit tablets uh, may be safely used and may not only be safe, but also beneficial to those patients. So asthma may be an area where slit tablets uh, can provide some additional efficacy and do so in a safe manner. So that's, that's one issue. I think the issue you brought up about patients who just can't get to the office, patients who otherwise would receive no treatment, uh, SLIT certainly provides an opportunity to treat those patients in an allergen modifying way wherein you modify the way the immune system is responding to their allergen exposure. And uh, that cannot happen when you're using conventional pharmacotherapy. So it gives us an option for those patients who otherwise wouldn't be getting subcutaneous uh, immunotherapy. And finally, the issue you've mentioned uh, very nicely of patients who just do not want to get injections, potentially we can get around that by uh, having them uh, receive the tablets on a, a daily basis. No matter what though, whether it's injections or tablets, uh, we have to stress adherence and adherence remains an issue uh, for both tablet immunotherapy and injectable immunotherapy, where as you've heard, there are barriers to adherence that have to be overcome. Uh, Justin, what are your thoughts? So great synopsis and, and you know, my point tends to go towards more of providing that option that we talked about. You know, when you run a, a business and you wanna practice, you're, you really wanna provide as many options as possible and individualize that treatment to patients. And I think that's a trend in medicine that we're seeing is really focusing in, in on the individual and not, you know, these broad, um, uh, treatment approaches. 
So I think uh, SLIP provides you know, another tool in your tool belt to really um, help improve patients' lives, improve patients' uh, daily symptom scores, um, and, and, and make you more competitive in, in a competitive market. Uh, you know, if you can offer these tablets and, and, and SKIT in addition, um, you're really giving a lot of options to your patients and it can have the potential to really affect their lives. So I think uh, all these points are, are, are great additions to a, a robust allergy practice. That's yeah, no, that's awesome, guys. Because I think um, for me, I'm like the buzz, the beautiful word right now is shared decision making, right? So we're all talking about shared decision making. So part of it is like I think it lets the patient also, to Justin's point, you know, be involved with their care. Like they feel that they are in the driver's seat more for their care as opposed to, hey, you're giving me a choice. It's getting away again from that paternalistic we're gonna decide for you what's the best, whether you can make it work or not. This way we're letting them be in that seat and be like, hey, and, and we present all the options. I say, okay, this is gonna cost this much per month you know, with your pharmaceutical insurance. This is what's gonna cost over here. So we're giving them a way to uh, decide what they wanna do with cost, but also with their lifestyle, and which I think is super important. We're gonna talk further about SLIT in the US. With acceptance, of SLIT in the U.S. It really kind of began uh, around 2013 when the AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, commissioned a large-scale comparative effectiveness review of both SKIT and SLIT. The study provided moderate to high support for the effectiveness and safety of both subcutaneous and sublingual immunotherapy for the treatment of allergic rhinitis and asthma. Now, the superiority of one route uh, over the other was not determined in this study, um, but uh, you know, there were follow-up reports uh, that, that continued to show efficacy with SLIT and SKIT. Following this report, the FDA did approve the first SLIT tablets in 2014. That was for both the ragweed and grass tablets. Not surprisingly, there was a significant uptick in SLIT usage, with a reported 73.5% using SLIT compared to around 6% a decade earlier. You know, when you give allergists more options, they tend to take advantage. Now, you know, looking at the U.S. is one thing, but uh, SLID has been around in Europe a lot longer. Uh, so, you know, looking at the European experience uh, can definitely be beneficial with regards to SLID adherence specifically. Uh, it's important to note that preferences for immunotherapy formulations vary across regions of the world. So Eastern Europe, Canada, Russia, and Southeast Asia have really embraced SLIT more than the U.S. has uh, and more than Western Europe has over the last decade or so. And with this first retrospective cohort study comparing medication adherence with SLIT tablets versus SKIT products, discontinuations in the first year of treatment were actually more frequent in patients taking SLIT tablets. So that's important to note, but those that continued treatment after the first year were less likely to discontinue treatment during the third year compared to those receiving SKIT. So that led to a comparable three-year persistence between both options. Um, now, early onset oral reactions could be responsible for the higher rates of discontinuation observed in that first year of treatment with SLIT. Um, there definitely was lower discontinuation rates uh, in the second and third years, which suggests that patients who really stick with SLIT treatment, who are married to their SLIT uh, treatment, as we mentioned earlier, um, until those adverse effects have disappeared, tend to have a greater treatment motivation and tend to potentially have better compliance long term uh, because you're seeing that kind of, you know, adherence to therapy and, and improvement in symptoms, uh, which really motivates them to continue. So the FDA has approved four allergy tablet products to date. The two grass pollen allergy tablets currently available were approved back in 2014 and are indicated for patients aged five to 65 years. So oral error has five kinds of northern grass pollen and grass tech has Timothy grass pollen. Ragwitech is a short ragweed tablet, and it was also approved in 2014 with a recent pediatric indication for patients aged five to 65 years. The fourth tablet on this list is dust mite tablet called Odactra, and that was approved in 2017. And Odactra is indicated for patients aged 18 to 65 years. Now, ALK also has a white birch tree pollen sublingual tablet that is currently approved in Canada, but has yet to be approved in the US. So that'll lead us into uh, an open panel discussion that I'll let Dr. Dubusky take over. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Justin. So we're going to talk about how does allergy training prepare you for the implementation of slit tablets in your practice? 
Second, what do you consider the role of slit tablets to be in your larger allergen immunotherapy practice? Third, how do you feel the allergy community response to slit has changed over the last 10 to 12 years? And fourth, how do patients receiving slit in your practice compare to patients receiving skit in terms of adherence? So uh, let's uh, open up the discussion and uh, uh, perhaps uh, we can begin with Dr. Bunzel in terms of her practice, she's indicated as community-based. Uh, in terms of these four issues, uh, what do you see in your own practice? I do feel that um, allergy training definitely prepares you because, um, you know, currently there is, uh, in the package insert, there is an indication that says that, you know, we you need to have epinephrine on hand. So in terms of being able to train the patient on how to do that first tablet of the immunotherapy and having them come in and understand that they have to wait their 30 minutes, they have to have their epinephrine. So that's all part of our allergy training, right? The other part of allergy training that I think prepares us is really trying to hone in on the history, right? So you may have a patient that's polysensitized and we know that like, you know, depending on these different studies uh, when we're gonna go through all of them, you know, that we've got 68 to maybe 86% patients in the different studies that are polysensitized. And even though you're polysensitized, um, and in Europe, it's a very different approach where you have a, you know, they really go for monotherapy in the US, it's, you know, trying to include more allergens. But the question is, if you have that right type of patient that comes in and says, well, I only flare a little bit during the season, but I'm kind of miserable all year round, and they want to do the dust mite immunotherapy, that makes sense for them. Or let's say that they want to do um, the right, you know, it, they only flare from August to October, and we know that that's ragweed season that ragweed dust, you know, sublingual immunotherapy tablet would be the right for them. So I think allergy training helps us hone in on what's the right patient, what's their barriers, and how, um, how to safely start them on immunotherapy and be able to train them for signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. So I do feel like our, our training prepares us quite a bit. I do feel like for me, specifically the role of sublingual immunotherapy tablets in my, um, in my larger practice is by adding more flexibility. Um, it, it, and again, once, allow, once again, allowing the practice to expand because other patients who typically like they wouldn't have done anything or they're doing multiple medications, four or five medications just to stay functional during the season or maybe needing steroids, um, these patients have something else that they can do that will work for them successfully. So, you know, when I, when I think of training, sometimes I harken back to fellowship and, you know, uh, at least when I was training, uh, slit therapy um, was approved the same year I graduated. So I didn't have specific training on slit implementation during my formal training. I, of course, assume that has changed now that these tablets have been FDA approved for years. Um, but one of the main issues I've seen, especially in kind of upcoming fellow graduates, is that a lot of the programs they're involved with uh, and the clinics they manage typically see a large proportion of, of patients that tend to have poor follow-up and non-compliance. So both skit and slit are difficult to start and maintain in, in these training scenarios. So I think that fellows aren't getting probably the best experience with these types of, of medications, um, just due to the fact of you know, where they're training and, and how they're being taught. So at least in my opinion, a lot of my experience with slit uh, was kind of more of a learn on the job type of experience. Um, and now of course, you know, using skit and other forms of immunotherapy have helped me specifically my experience with oral food immunotherapy, which I implemented back in 2014, really helped me prepare for some of my experiences with slit, uh, given, you know, a similar route of action and, and similar side effects. So, you know, I think, you know, grabbing insights from different facets of my training and different experiences along the way um, kind of molded my uh, appreciation and, um, you know, in the way I use slip in, in an everyday basis. And my, uh, my view is that uh, in allergy training programs, we really have emphasized a uh, skit and especially how to uh, develop uh, the uh, overall extract composition that is used for patient treatment sets in skit. And there's a much greater emphasis on skit and uh, how you write 
uh, for skit than there is uh, for slit. Now, over time, this may change. The slit tablets, which have been the focus of tonight's discussion, uh, and which uh, Justin has showed you have received FDA approval, have been the most heavily studied and rigorously uh, developed of the formats of slit. And it's nice that Dr. Bunsell mentioned the slit drops because the slit drops have been available for years, often uh, initially used by the ear, nose and throat community, but now uh, by a number of community-based allergists. Uh, but I think it has to be remembered that uh, neither the slit drops as compounded nor their individual uh, components uh, have ever been approved and uh, verified uh, by the FDA as opposed to the slit tablets. And it's not that there haven't been attempts because there have been attempts uh, to gain FDA approval of uh, slit drops, but uh, that has not as of yet succeeded. Uh, the literature for slit drops uh, which initially came from uh, Europe and some from the US uh, ear, nose and throat community, uh, shows efficacy, but it's very scattered in terms of the results of the various studies for pollens and especially dust mite with regard to wide variances in the efficacy shown and the ability to impact symptoms and medication use. Whereas the tablet literature is much more consistent in terms of the magnitude of benefit seen, usually at least 15% mean difference from placebo and the ability to reduce medication utilization. So I, I just like to indicate that the tablet literature is in my view, very different than a literature on the slit drops. Yet, if you go into the community, uh, among allergists today, I dare say there's much greater use of the slit drops than there is of the slit tablets. And then the question is why? Uh, one reason could be, as already stated, uh, the tablets treat one allergen and the American allergist is used to treating multiple allergens. And you can do that by compounding drops. Another reason, which is not quite as noble, that the drops provide an economic incentive for those who prescribe them, whereas the tablets don't. There's no economic benefit for writing for the slit tablets uh, to the allergist. Now, we would hope this would not drive therapy, but the reality is uh, in a private practice, which is a business, uh, issues such as the economic bottom line uh, have to be recognized and may be impacting the utilization in the US of these drops versus tablets. It's interesting, if you go to Europe, where most of the allergists are working in health systems and what they prescribe does not necessarily impact them economically, uh, the tablets are very well accepted now and have really become the, the normative form of therapy uh, in some places uh, when it comes to treating uh, allergic disease versus utilization of the drops. But I think it's important to recognize in the United States that uh, the drops, at least in many private practices, are probably the dominant form of sublingual immunotherapy being utilized. So that's uh, just a, a consideration. In terms of practice, I think the tablets are there for patients who are not going to get subcutaneous immunotherapy, uh, for whom it's not convenient, they don't want the needles, or they don't have the ability to come into the office. For instance, I have a patient I recently started who lives about 45 minutes outside of Washington, D.C., could not in any way come into our practice every week, whereas he could do the tablets at home without any problem. With regard to the allergy community, uh, uptake of the tablets has been slow, uptake of the drops has been faster. And I think much of that is economically driven. And with regard to adherence, the worst case example 
for the skit would be the Florida Medicaid study uh, that was done a number of years ago showing only 15% adherence with skit over a three year period of time, probably a worst case scenario based on it being a Medicaid population. Whereas the slit tablets, while we hope that adherence could be better, we do know that uh, loss of adherence 30 to 40% over time has been reported in the literature and it's especially problematic early on in the utilization, the, the first few months of treatment. So both slit tablets and skit have adherence issues. One could argue based on a practice setting that uh, one uh, induces more adherence than the other. Uh, but in both cases, what I found is continuously being in contact with the patient, having the patient come back for follow-up visits, whether it's skit or slit tablet, really encourages adherence. Any other thoughts uh, from uh, Dr. Scrawey and, and uh, Dr. Bunyan? For, you know, the only last thought I have is I, kind of on your comment on adherence, I think that's where it's been a little bit, you know, like you said, a little bit that education portion to have them come in is, is critical. You know, even if it's the tablet, you can't just start them on the tablet and say, see you in six months, because I don't think that that's going to be as successful. I also think an adherence makes a difference what kind of tablet you're doing, um, because I think you know, sometimes if they're doing a specific pollen tablet and they see those results right away because they started 12 weeks before the season and they do it right away and they see those results, they're more apt to maybe do it year after year. Whereas sometimes I find um, with the dust mite tablet specifically that they need a little bit more encouragement because that is a year round therapy. So I think it's even more critical to bring the Odactra or the dust mite tablet in more often than sometimes the pollen patient. So just anybody who's prescribing, I would advise that to be aware of that um, because I think it'll help the compliance further along because it's a perennial allergen and it's, it's a little bit harder for um, some patients to wrap their mind around it, uh, why they're doing this all the time. And now we'll be discussing slit tablet efficacy and safety. And Dr. Gry, we will begin with a discussion of grass pollen slit tablets. As we mentioned, uh, we're going to focus mainly on Timothy grass pollen slit tablets first. We're going to use three studies that really give credence to slit as a treatment option. So all three of the following studies evaluated Timothy grass pollen standardized quality units tablets versus placebo. And both treatment arms were permitted to take symptom relieving medications during the course of the trial as needed. The first study by Durham et al. investigated sustained efficacy and disease modification in a five-year adult study, including two years of blinded follow-up after the completion of a three-year treatment period with a standardized grass allergy tablet. So the results of this study confirmed disease modification by grass allergy tablets, in addition to effective symptomatic treatment of allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. Now, the second study here is a 24-week study by Maloney et al., and looked at U.S. patients aged 5 to 65 years with grass allergy treated with Timothy grass tablets versus placebo. The primary endpoint in this study was total combined score, which combined rhinoconjunctivitis daily symptom scores plus daily medication scores over the entire grass pollen season. So this study concluded that once daily Timothy grass tablets were effective in polysensitized grass allergic North American children and adults with allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. So a consistent pattern here for both studies. And finally, like the previous study, this final report by Blaze et al. assessed first grass pollen season efficacy in subjects treated with Timothy grass tablets, but focused on children and adolescents aged 5 to 17 years. And this study concluded that the use of once daily grass tablets effectively treated Timothy grass pollen induced allergic rhinoconjunctivitis in North American children 5 years and older. So, so really kind of better evidence that really supported North American efficacy uh, compared to previous studies that were done in Europe. Um, so, so three pivotal trials that uh, are good to reference if you want more information. Now, the next slide, um, you know, it's kind of helpful to go into some of these endpoints. So typically primary endpoints for assessing the response of allergic rhinoconjunctivitis to specific immunotherapy are the rhinoconjunctivitis symptom and medication scores, which we mentioned earlier, which may be reported separately 
or in a combined score. So because both symptom and medication scores are reduced by effective treatment of allergic chronic conjunctivitis, it is now considered advantageous to report the two responses in a single combined score as outlined in the figure provided. All relative differences were statistically significant, but as you can see, the rhinoconjunctivitis daily medication score was reduced by 20 to 45%, and the weighted rhinoconjunctivitis combined score were reduced by 27 to 41% in favor of the active treatment. So the mean rhinoconjunctivitis daily symptom score was reduced by 25 to 36%, in the grass allergy immunotherapy group compared to the placebo group over the five grass pollen seasons covered by the trial. So pretty impressive reductions there. The total combined score for each treatment group is plotted against daily average pollen counts in the figure provided here. So grass pollen count is represented in orange, a placebo group is represented in the blue, and the grass tablet group in green. So daily total combined score generally paralleled the mean pollen counts in this slide, between treatment differences were observed at the beginning of the grass season, as well as throughout the season. So in the analysis of primary endpoint, grass tablet treatment yielded a reduction or improvement versus placebo of 23% in median total combined score over the entire grass pollen season. So in addition, grass tablet treatment showed a 29% reduction versus placebo in median total combined score over the peak grass pollen season, when subjects tended to have the most severe symptoms and really needed those rescue uh, medications to, to maintain control. So all important points. Now, this next slide looks into daily symptom scores or DSS and daily medication scores or DMS over the entire and peak grass pollen season as outlined in this figure. So medians were reported for the DSS and means were reported for the DMS. So let's first address daily symptom scores on the left-hand side of this figure. So grass tablet treatment in orange yielded a 20% reduction versus placebo in the mean DSS over the entire grass pollen season and a 20% reduction in DSS versus placebo during the peak grass pollen season. Nasal and ocular scores over the entire grass pollen season also showed similar improvements, which is important to note. When we move on to daily medication scores on the right side, they tend to tell a similar story as well. So grass tablet treatment yielded a 35% reduction versus placebo in mean DMS over the entire grass pollen season and a 36% reduction versus placebo in mean DMS over the peak grass pollen season. Now this next slide looks into total combined scores and pollen counts over time. So the grass pollen season lasted a medium of 56 days in the grass tablet group and 57 days in the placebo group here, which is a mean grass pollen count of 28 grains per cubic meter per day. Now, although tree pollen count was present at the start of the grass pollen season, and many subjects were sensitive to tree allergens, symptoms and medication scores in the grass tablet treatment group did not seem to be markedly influenced by the high tree pollen counts. And that's important to note. Separation of total combined scores between the two treatment groups began approximately four weeks before the start of the grass pollen season. An increase in total combined scores paralleled increasing pollen counts throughout the season, and the same relationship was observed as pollen counts waned. The mean total combined scores for the entire grass pollen season was 4.62 in the grass AIT group and 6.25 in the placebo group, corresponding to a significant improvement in grass tablet group relative to that seen in the placebo group of only 26%. So a lot of data to throw at you, um, but, but definitely interesting and consistent data uh, over multiple studies presented in the last few slides. Next, Dr. Bonsall, you would like to present the five grass pollen slit tablet data? We're gonna start with the first slide with the North American field study. You can see that there was a screening period up to 12 weeks. The treatment period lasted approximately four months, and then they were randomized to receive either 300 IR, which was about 233 people, versus placebo. And then they had a follow-up period where they were assessed. The grass pollen season was determined by the first three consecutive days with at least 10 grains per meter cubed of air and ending on the last three consecutive days with those same measurements. So that's kind of how they defined and determined exactly what the grass pollen season is. So you can see that we're starting the tablet before, continuing it throughout the season, and then reassessed at the end of the season. 
Looking at the clinical efficacy here on this graph, you see the mean daily combined score. And this is the time from the first day of the pollen period. So you see kind of the start of the pollen. The placebo group is in orange. The treatment group is in blue. So we can clearly see that the patients that received the five grass pollen slit tablet had considerably less in their main daily symptom score, even though you could see the height and the climbing of the pollen. So you're going in parallel to the placebo, but considerably less in terms of uh, their symptoms and um, pretty actively being treated even for this by day zero, by this first point where um, where the pollen is first starting to spike there, you know, again, because we've pre-started the tablet, they're already starting to see their results. Moving on, if we try to look at the different um, the different patient populations, right? So what are we looking at in, uh, in what are we trying to treat? And a lot of times there's um, the conception that they only have to be grass pollen allergic, they only have to be monosensitized. But if you look at both groups, you can see that there was an equal number if we looked at the number receiving after treatment versus placebo that were mono versus polysensitized. There were also equal on both sides of the treatment and placebo group with and without asthma. We had children versus adults, female versus male, as well as different types of pollen exposure, low, medium, and high. You can see between the two groups, whether they were treated, whether they received placebo, it was a pretty even break overall. What is the efficacy, like longer term efficacy, if I decide to do the grass pollen slit tablet? And what's the impact on its induced rhinoconjunctivitis? So we had 633 patients. They were randomized to either receive placebo for the first three years. The second group received placebo for the start and then throughout the season and then placebo in between for the first three years. And then the last group was randomized to receive treatment throughout the three years. So what happens to them in year four and five? And that's where we're trying to really see is, okay, like afterwards, are they still having, um, are they still having some reduction in their sy sy symptoms in the next few seasons? If we look at the efficacy of the five grass pollen tablet two years after treatment cessation, we're looking at on the left, the daily combined symptom score, and on the bottom, we're looking at the different years across therapy. So year one, we're seeing a 16% reduction. By year two, we're at 38%, year three, 38%. But even continuing when we're not doing the grass pollen tablet, we're seeing a 25 and 28% reduction in year four and five. Now I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Bessie to talk about the ragweed slit tablet. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Bunsel. So the ragweed slit tablet initiative, I was uh, fortunate to be an investigator in, so it's nice to be able to present this uh, data. Short ragweed sublingual tablet studies, the initial pivotal ones, were done essentially in adults. And so these studies were 52 week studies. There were patients 18 to 50 years of age. They were done in parallel as the FDA requires two parallel studies to get approval. And what was done was to assess peak ragweed pollen efficacy during the peak season of these ragweed tablets. The North American adult studies both showed uh, that the tablets were effective. Work had been done dose ranging with these tablets showing that the 12 MA1U was the best dose in terms of both efficacy and safety, and these tablets could be self-administered. The way these studies were done were to begin the studies pre-seasonally and continue the treatment uh, through the allergy season and then continue on to get one year of data which essentially was safety data uh, for the use of the tablets. So these two studies, one lead author Kretikos, the other lead author Hendrik Nolte, together had over 1,200 subjects in them, taking a look at the ragweed tablet data, total combined symptoms were significantly reduced compared to placebo. The point estimate was 24 to 26% reduction in symptoms. Critical here is the 95% confidence interval because the FDA established a parameter 
which was that you have to achieve at least a 10% difference from placebo at the 95% confidence interval in order for the FDA to accept that you really had efficacy. And here, as you can see, the Credico study ranged from 11 to 36% difference from placebo, the Nolte study, 14 to 38% difference, P highly significant for both studies. Now, why is that important? Well, the FDA has established that they want to see at least a 10% treatment effect in 95% of people. It's, it's, a, it's a tough uh, parameter to reach. And in fact, what we heard previously about the five grass pollen tablets and the five-year study, in year four and year five with the five grass tablets, while they showed efficacy that looks very good in terms of the, the daily medication symptom score reduction, uh, they didn't achieve that 95% confidence interval of at least 10% in years four and five. So those tablets actually are not approved by the FDA for sustained efficacy beyond the three years of pre-seasonal treatment. And it's important that was only done pre-seasonally two to four months before the grass season. In the Timothy grass tablet, which was given year round for three years, year four, which is the first year after stopping those tablets, did achieve the 95% confidence interval of at least 10%. But year five did not, where the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval was 8% rather than 10%. So those Timothy grass tablets uh, received labeling stating that they show efficacy for one year after stoppage. So the FDA takes this very seriously. And if you don't show a 10% uh, at least difference in the 95% confidence interval, they won't grant you uh, efficacy with regard to indication. Should also like to mention that the FDA requires for all of these studies uh, that you have not only a positive skin test, but also a positive allergen specific immunoglobulin E, generally speaking, class two or greater in order to enroll subjects. And uh, one of the five grass studies that you just saw presented uh, enrolled all comers, irrespective of their allergen-specific immunoglobulin E. And if the allergen-specific immunoglobulin E was 0.1 or less, they really didn't see much efficacy, as opposed to if it was greater than that. And that really shows that there is a dynamic here in terms of the immune modulation you see that does depend on the subjects producing significant amounts of allergen-specific immunoglobulin E at baseline in order to see efficacy. Now, a big question has arisen and it's been mentioned uh, by both of my colleagues as to what happens if you're polysensitized. And in the ragweed initiatives, Maloney elegantly showed that if you take a look at the monosensitized individuals, which is shown on the upper right of this slide, there's a 15% overall improvement with the AMB-A1 at six units, a 19% improvement with the AMB-A1 at 12 units, and the 12 units was the dose that was chosen. But if you look in a polysensitized individuals, they actually got a bigger response, a 27% improvement in the AMB-A1 12 units, and the whole group had a 23% improvement. And what it showed is that polysensitized individuals respond at least as well as the monosensitized individuals. And in these ragweed studies, about 75% of the enrolled subjects were polysensitized, which meant they had allergen-specific immunoglobulin E and skin test positivity to animal danders, uh, to dust mites, to grass pollens, to tree pollens, not just ragweed pollen. So if you're polysensitized, you still do respond. Now, more recently, studies have been done looking at the population excluded in the initial pivotal trials. Again, those initial pivotal trials were 18 and above. Now we're going to look at children and adolescents 5 to 17 years of age. Huge study, over 1,000 individuals. And 77% of these children and adolescents were in fact polysensitized. 
They're randomized on a one-on-one -on -one basis to daily ragweed slit tablet or placebo. The primary endpoint again is gonna be the average total combined symptoms and that's the sum of the daily symptom scores and the daily medication scores during the peak of the ragweed pollen season. And the secondary endpoint is gonna be the total combined symptoms during the ragweed pollen season, not just the peak. And we're also going to be looking at the daily medication scores and the symptoms in the peak of the ragweed season. And let's see what we see. So here is the total combined symptoms during the peak and the entire ragweed pollen season and the daily symptom scores and the daily medication scores during the peak in these children. On the left, the total combined symptoms in the peak and the entire ragweed season, a dramatic difference with the use of the ragweed slit tablet. Look, 38% a reduction in symptoms during the peak ragweed pollen season, 32% reduction in the entire ragweed pollen season. And if you look at not just the total combined symptoms, but break it out, the daily symptom scores on the left, the daily medication scores on the right, 35% reduction in the daily symptom scores 47.7% reduction in daily medication scores during the peak of the ragweed pollen season. So a really powerful effect of these tablets during the ragweed season. And then they broke it out. How about those children and adolescents who also had asthma who were in these studies? And you could have mild to moderate asthma and, and be a participant in the studies. And when I looked at the asthma daily symptom scores in the asthmatic children, Wow, a 30% reduction in those children in the daily symptom scores, their symptoms of asthma, a 68% reduction in short-acting beta agonist utilization, a 75% reduction in nocturnal awakening. So what we're seeing here is if you have allergic rhinitis with allergic asthma that is related to ragweed, these slit tablets will not only improve the rhinitis symptoms and reduce rhinitis medications, but your concurrent asthma symptoms are reduced and your concurrent asthma requirement for a short acting beta agonist and symptoms of nocturnal awakening dramatically reduced in those children who are on the tablets. Now we're going to segue from the seasonal allergen ragweed to the perennial allergen house dust mite and look at what happens with house dust mite tablet immunotherapy. Now, this was explored initially using an environmental exposure chamber. And the questions being raised, number one, what's the best dose? So they looked at two different doses, 6DU and 12DU of the dust mite tablet versus placebo. And then second, what's the kinetics? How rapidly will you get an effect? And you've heard from Dr. Bunsell, this can be an issue with patients. Patient adherence may be impacted if they don't perceive that something is going on. Well, in this environmental exposure chamber study, what was done was to assess patients who received the dust mite tablet. And they looked at some subjects who had asthma. They typically had disease for about 16 to 17 years. Most of the subjects were in their late 20s, but they ranged from 18 to 58 years of age and often polysensitized. And if you take a look at polysensitization, over 83% were polysensitized. If you take a look at the placebo group, if you take a look at the active treatment group, 88 to 90% were polysensitized. And what did this mean? Well, they're sensitized not only to dust mite, but to birch tree, timothy grass, cat dander, dog dander. Many of them who had asthma, and again, overall, we're taking a look at subjects who have asthma around 24 to 27%, of whom a few were using inhaled corticosteroids. These subjects came in symptomatic in terms of dust mite exposure, but what happens to them with treatment? So we're going to take a look at times when they're exposed in the chamber. So what we're looking at by week eight, we mean that they've had eight weeks of treatment. Week 16, they've had 16 weeks of treatment. Week 24, which means they've had essentially six months of treatment. 
and they're being exposed to dust mite in this environmental exposure chamber, and they either had placebo over this period of time, the low dose dust mite or the higher dose dust mite. And what's interesting is by eight weeks, the higher dose dust mite has separated from placebo in terms of less total symptom score being expressed 23% difference versus placebo during that chamber exposure to dust mite. So an onset of action can be established of around two months after you've begun the dust mite tablet. If you go out to 16 weeks, even further improvement, 30% difference from placebo. And if you go out 24 weeks, now both the lower dose and the higher dose are achieving statistically significant differences from placebo with the higher dose showing a 52% reduction in symptoms during that dust mite chamber challenge compared to those subjects who are on placebo. So clearly a very big benefit over a 50% reduction compared to those folks on placebo, but it takes six months to achieve that. But by two months, you're seeing a, a difference. So with this established, the higher dose was taken out into the field. And once again, I'm very happy to have been part of this study using the 12 SQ tablet versus placebo. And here we have a huge number of people who are part of this study, over 1400 subjects. Again, these subjects typically were in their mid thirties. Asthma was present in about 30% of them inhaled corticosteroid use in about 30%, albeit with good lung function. We're looking at FEV1 percents of predicted 97, 98%. They had allergic rhinitis for about 18 or 19 years. Once again, the minority are monosensitized. Around 25% are only sensitized to dust mite. About 75% are sensitized to dust mite and pollens and animal danders and the like. These people are highly sensitized. If you look at their wheel sizes for dust mite, it runs around 10 millimeters. So these are big wheel size on skin test. And if you look at allergen specific IgE to both dust mites, running on a range of 13 to 14, up to 16 kilounits. So substantial amounts of allergen specific IgE, substantial size of their skin test. So we would say, yes, highly sensitized individuals. So the way this was done is to give the tablets over a year and the last eight weeks were the efficacy analysis period. And the tablets were begun in the winter. So this efficacy analysis period is essentially in the winter of the following year, end of the fall into the winter, which was considered the dust mite season when you don't have confounding pollen seasons. And what you see is that the total combined symptoms are 17% improved, the rhinitis daily symptoms 16% improved, medication score 18% improved, and overall a 17% improvement. Statistically significant at a P less than 0 0.001 compared to placebo. So significant improvement in each of these parameters in the full analysis set. Now, in Europe, a similar study was done. Again, a year round study, but they did some interesting analysis. And that is to look at the pollen season and look at what happened to these people who are polysensitized and 68% were polysensitized. And you're only treating with the dust mite tablet and you're beginning it in the dead of winter. So 14 weeks after treatment has begun, well, that's the tree pollen season in Europe. 24 to 34 weeks after the treatment's begun, well, that's the grass pollen season in Europe. And what you see is that during the tree pollen season and the grass pollen season, the folks who are only being treated with dust mite, and yes, they're polysensitized, are having less symptoms than the folks who are being treated with placebo even though we're not yet in what we consider the dust season, which is the dead of winter the following year. So by treating this major allergen dust mite, you're debulking the overall allergens driving symptoms as dust mites are present year round. And in those individuals who are tree and grass sensitized, even though you're not treating tree and grass, 
by treating dust mite, you achieve a lower symptom burden. Both symptoms and medications reduced by treating dust mite in these polysensitized people during their respective tree and grass seasons. Now, a question, how about interruption of treatment? And this is a big issue with adherence because what happens if you miss some time? Do you have to go back into a physician's office to get the tablets again like you do with the very first dose? So what was done was to take a look at the environmental exposure chamber study, take a look at the field study, and look at what happened if you interrupt the treatment for two or more days for any reason. And then what happened when the treatment was reinstituted, specifically looking at the 12 SQ tablet and what happened to those folks. So with the 12 SQ tablets, well, interruption happened in these studies. You take a look, 60% of people had some interruption. And it's surprising, the median was seven days of interruption. The mean was 13 days. And then what happens when they reinstitute the tablets? Nobody had a systemic allergic reaction. Nobody needed epinephrine. Nobody had severe local swelling. And most adverse events on reinitiation were judged by the investigator to be mild or moderate. Now, this is in the studies that we discussed, which were the dust mite studies. In addition to that, we have other data. And that other data includes over 3,000 post-marketing reports. So that's, somebody reports after the tablet is out that something happened. And there's one anaphylactic reaction that occurred following a one and a half month treatment interruption. And it occurred on day one of reinitiation. So that's what we have, one case, in 3,000 post-marketing reports, and it was a long period of interruption, uh, one and a half months. Here we're talking seven days to two weeks, typically, of interruption without anything major happening. And if you look at the adverse event profile on reinitiation, which was done, you know, when you begin to dust my tablets, you have a very typical adverse event profile on day one. And that's shown here. 43% of people get oral itch. 43% of people get throat irritation. 29% of people get ear itch. 11% of people get some nasal pharyngitis experience. That's on day one. What happens when you reintroduce the tablet after this variable interruption? Well, only 8% of people reported oral itch, 8% of people throat irritation, 6% ear itch, 3.4% nasal pharyngitis. So I think it's rather evident here the local events, and these are all considered local because the mouth, the throat, the ears, the nasal pharynx are all considered sort of local shock organs for the tablets, just like the arm is the local shock organ for the injections where you get the initial response. Here with interruption, very low level of issues, nothing that is leading to something systemic that would require epinephrine and certainly suggests that reinitiation can safely be done at home. So what seems rather clear is that safety of short-term interruption and reinitiation, uh, there's really no safety signal here. And a proportion of subjects who experience treatment emergent adverse events after reinitiation was similar. Interestingly, tablets 29%, placebo 26%. Most adverse events, mild and moderate, no systemic reactions, no epinephrine use, no severe local swelling. So I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Bunsel, who's going to talk about an investigational product, uh, which is a, a birch tree slit tablet product, not yet available in the U.S., but uh, available in Canada. So Dr. Bunsel. So you've seen some of the approved um tablets that are in the U.S. Again, this is approved in Canada, but not approved in the U.S. So we're looking at the birch pollen season. So basically, knowing that they were screened April to October, then they were randomized September, October, they were off season October to November. And they did do some efficacy measurements in this trial. So they had 320 that received the sublingual immunotherapy tablet, 314 in placebo. We could also see that originally you have hazel season, then alder, then birch. 
they did do some measurements at each of these. So you're seeing different peaks of the different tree seasons. We were also looking at different subjects, again, that were about in the same age range as some of the other tablets started with prior to the pediatric indication. So they were 18 to 65 years old. They had persistent, moderate to severe allergic rhinoconjunctivitis that actually was bad enough that it interfered with their sleep patterns. They had a positive skin prick test to Birch, and they had to have used symptom relieving medications for at least the two previous tree pollen seasons. So it was a very defined group. So this looked at two different things. We have the adjusted mean allergic rhinoconjunctivitis score. And again, it's showing a significant P level here. And we're looking specifically at birch pollen season and then the overall tree pollen season. So in birch pollen season, there was a 40% reduction compared to placebo in the total combined score. And then also 37% in your daily symptom score 49% in your daily medication score. So again, pretty significant if you look across um, both groups for birch pollen specifically, and we know they were birch pollen positive, but what about you know some of these other trees that are in the environment? What else happens over there? Well, overall in the tree pollen season, we're noticing a 37% reduction in total combined score, 33% daily symptom and 47% in daily medication score. So even though once again, you're using a birch tablet and you're getting exposed to other tree pollen, it's still helping um, throughout the tree pollen season. Looking specifically at the efficacy, not during birch season, but off season during alder hazel pollen season, we're seeing again, 30% reduction in total combined score, 26% in the daily symptom score and 44% in the daily medication score compared to placebo. So what are the most active um, adverse events? So it's very similar when you're looking at the dust mite tablet, the ragotech, the grass tech, very similar in terms of oral pruritus, some throat irritation, maybe you have some mouth irritation, some mouth swelling, tongue itching. We do see some people that get ear itching as well. Some oral pharyngeal pain, swollen tongue, hypesthesia. So again, very concentrated. So I tell people it's very similar to if you're doing subcutaneous immunotherapy and they develop a large local in that. It, this is kind of, the, I tell patients, it's kind of you developing that reaction in your mouth. So these were, you know, at least um, the adverse reactions that we commonly see in more than 5% of the subjects that were on uh, the immunotherapy tablet. And um, so after reviewing, uh, you know, some of this data, and we've been through all of these tablets now, right? So we've looked at um, the grass, we've looked at ragweed, we've looked at dust and the investigational tree tablet. I'm now going to pass it on Justin to be able to look at some of the safety considerations that we all faced when doing the sublingual immunotherapy tablet. Well, thank you. And again, um, as with all immunotherapy, there's always risks. And we're going to talk about specific FDA class labeling uh, for slip box warnings in, in this slide. Although rare, the slip can cause life for any allergic reactions. Most adverse events are typically local oral reactions that occur pretty early on in treatment and usually disappear during the first days or weeks without any medical intervention as the immune system kind of develops tolerance over time. So those are the most common complaints you're going to see, as mentioned in previous slides. But it is important to note that even with these kind of mild local symptoms, they can be bothersome enough to cause a treatment discontinuation. So having those conversations with your patients is important. Of course, do not administer SLIT to patients with severe, unstable, or uncontrolled asthma. And this is you know, a really important point. And in our office, asthma screening uh, with pulmonary function testing and pheno is standard of care prior to initiating any form of, uh, or, of immunotherapy, whether that's SLIT, SKIT, or OIT. Uh, so we really make sure we've, we've kind of screened out any asthmatics that are hiding in plain sight. It's also important to observe patients in the office at least 30 minutes following the initial dose as this dose has been associated with a higher risk of reaction. And oftentimes we use this time frame to go over any remaining questions patients might have about SLIT and really coach them on what they might expect in the coming weeks to months. Prescribing an epinephrine auto-injector for all new starts is encouraged with proper instruction and training. And that's important to note because a lot of times we just give these medications and send them out the door. Uh, and then when they get in a scenario where they need it, uh, a lot of patients uh, you know, get nervous or freak out and don't administer the medicine correctly. So, so really go over that with them in detail. 
We always provide a slit action plan that can be provided to patients, instructing them on when to seek immediate medical care if they do use their epinephrine. Now, slit might not be suitable for all patients with certain underlying medical conditions, and this is true for SCID as well. Uh, and, and we're looking at patients specifically who have reduced ability to survive serious adverse reactions. And these typically include patients with severe cardiovascular or respiratory conditions. So SLIT might not be suitable for those patients or in patients who might be unresponsive to epinephrine or inhaled bronchodilators, such as those patients taking beta blockers. So these are all things that we keep in mind when we start patients on immune therapy in our offices. Um, so now uh, that we've got that out of the way, uh, Dr. Dubusky is going to talk um, about some, some panel discussion um, uh, topics that we'll, we'll review with each other. So I think uh, it's been very nicely uh, shown that uh, slit tablets are effective and uh, generally can be considered safe. The real issues that have come up with slit more recently are do the tablets work in children? Are they safe in children? Uh, do they work if you're polysensitized? Uh, can you reinstitute them at home if they've been discontinued? And how do you and the patient arrive at your clinical decision making, your shared clinical decision making with regard to the use of these slit tablets, discussing both efficacy and safety? So I think the, the data we've presented here shows that these tablets are, are equally effective in children and adults, although we don't have yet pediatric approval for the dust mite tablets. So I'll give that one caveat, but ragweed and grass, we do have both pediatric and adult data and both the pediatric and adult data are compelling in terms of efficacy. Uh, the polysensitized patients respond just as well as the monosensitized, and it appears they can be safely administered after discontinuation. In terms of the shared decision-making, I think this really is the biggest question. How do you introduce the slit tablets to the patient? When do you introduce it? Uh, do you wait for the patient to bring up the possibility, or do you uh, initiate this discussion? And how do you uh, place the safety and efficacy of skit versus slit, in addition to the, the convenience of skit versus slit, when you have that discussion with the patient? So I'm going to ask uh, my two colleagues uh, how they frame that shared decision making and what their thoughts are in terms of use of these tablets in children, polysensitized, or issues of uh, some temporary discontinuation having occurred. So uh, Justin and uh, Priya, what are your thoughts? I've not had any major issues with reinstitution um, of the tablets after um, you know, discontinuation. A as mentioned in the previous slides, most of my discontinuation is uh, a, a short amount of time, anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. Um, but really, um, when restarting those, those, those tablets, uh, we've had very mild um, reactions and, and most patients don't have any issues with that. Um, now, non-compliance non should not impact safety uh, based on the data, um, except if you're doing an, an excessively long um, uh, therapeutic gap, like that 1.5 months we talked about earlier. Um, but it is definitely important to you know, provide patients a clear, clear instructions on not taking extra doses in an attempt to catch up. I've seen that uh, occur in, in, in practices where they think if they just take extra doses, uh, they'll, they'll kind of catch up to where they were before. Um, this is particularly important uh, at times when symptoms are very severe or they're kind of in the middle of their, uh, middle of their very severe allergy season. So, so having these discussions beforehand and kind of catching these mistakes that patients kind of attempt to self-treat at home. And that's one of the, the disadvantages of SLED is, is you get that kind of self-treatment and, and alterations in therapy that we often see with at-home medications. So it's really important to have those discussions and really warn patients that, you know, if you're not following my directions appropriately, you know, reactions can occur. There's been guidelines put out by the Otolaryngology Society. There's also been guidelines put out by the Academy in terms of how to administer, like, should we do it um, immunotherapy on the same day as we're doing um, our COVID vaccine? So, you know, I do give them guidance kind of based off of that. Usually we withhold for about, you know, and I've seen offices, uh, according to the otolaryngology, it's been 24 hours, the academy, they're not commenting on slit tablets specifically, but they were commenting about um, immunotherapy. They were saying about 48 hours. So I think, um, 
you know, having that discussion proactively with somebody who's uh, that you're thinking about doing a COVID vaccine for might be helpful. And then also them understanding that, it, you know, because sometimes even if they miss a day or two, their mouth might get itchy or their throat might get itchy. So they might be scared. So at least let them know that if you're missing the tablet for more than a day, um, you know, just be aware you might get some of these initial symptoms again. Well, I think that's a, a very important point. And it really brings us to our next portion of this discussion. And that is slit tablet patient identification and uh, clinical considerations. And I introduce again, uh, Dr. Grawi to uh, take us through these issues. Much like the debate on which biologic to use for severe asthmatics, um, you know, providers are now faced with this conundrum of, you know, which immunotherapy regimen is going to be the most useful for my patient in clinical practice. So we touched base on a lot of the pros and cons for both approaches. Some of the main points are highlighted in this slide. Both SLIT and SKIT have been shown to be beneficial for the therapy of seasonal allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. SLIT often has a better safety profile when you look at the data with less systemic reactions to date. SKIT has a slightly better efficacy profile and readily allows for treatment of those polyallergic patients. Both modalities have the potential to induce long-term remission and are effective in patients with perennial rhinitis as well. It's not mentioned on this slide, but both SKIT and SLIT tablets have been shown to reduce the risk of developing asthma, particularly in children. And local side effects are common and well-tolerated for both modalities. Of course, SKIT requires administration in clinic, while SLIT can be administered at home. On the other hand, SKIT is easily monitored with frequent office visits, while SLIT patients can be lost to follow-up. But direct comparative evidence of SKIT versus SLIT is pretty weak, and more definitive trials are needed. So deciding on which option to provide to your patients is often a collaborative effort, uh, considering the patient's preferences and treatment goals. Um, children can often have needle phobia, as we've mentioned, um, and skip buildup can be tra a traumatic experience for some. Um, so, you know, with some slip products currently approved for children over five, this could be a, a more toler tolerable option for this age group. So, so these are kind of some of the, 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 the insights and things we're thinking about as we make these clinical decisions for our patients in the office. So the, the questions being raised in this component of the panel discussion are, number one, how do discontinuation rates in your practice compare to the community standard? Number two, in the context of this information, how do you select a patient for slit tablet therapy in your practice? And number three, are there special considerations for patients who are polysensitized? So I'll open that up to uh, Dr. Bunsell and Dr. Grawi in terms of their practices and uh, how they feel these questions apply. And I guess for myself, I would say the discontinuation rate, um, it really depends on the tablet. Uh, if I was looking on the tablet compared, like I think the discontinuation rate of allergy immunotherapy, I think in multiple studies, you know, it's, uh, in looking at SKIT, you're looking into like different studies, 30s to 40s. And I think that's pretty um, consistent. Like like Justin said, like we, we might see it a little bit, maybe one practice will see more male than female, but like in general, you might see it in particular populations more and that's um, as expected. I think... Um, for the tablet discontinuation, I do find personally that the ones who take the pollen tablets have, are very are much more compliant than my dust mite tablet patients. And I feel because dust mite, they do have to hang in for the long haul. And it's not like they feel the spike a particular season. It's all year round. And I think that's what makes it a little more difficult. So doing some of that counseling at the very beginning for me has been very helpful to say, yes, you may see the start of, you know, helping you out in eight weeks, but really to get you feeling good, we need several months um, and kind of making them come in for the follow-up more often for um, my house dust my tablet patients has been very helpful. Um, I don't feel necessarily, you know, again, because we're seeing this polysensitization in a majority of our patients, I would say majority of this. So I don't feel like I look at somebody like, oh, you're polysensitized, you're monosensitized. Monosensitization, yeah, that makes it exciting. It makes it clear. Like if somebody comes out and they're only sensitized to ragweed and they have ragweed and I give them you know, a ragweed tablet or do skit for ragweed, that's easy. That's a no brainer. I think most people do have this polysensitization. So it's more of a matter of having that shared decision-making, having that discussion with them, 
Do you want to come in? Do you not want to come in? Is this your primary allergen that's affecting you? And that's why it can't be a blanket statement, I feel, across the board. It has to be tailored to that individual patient. Because what if they do want to come in for skip, but their deductible is $10,000? Maybe, maybe that's why they don't want to do it. So there's many different reasons why somebody, or maybe their medical or their pharmaceutical coverage, like I have patients that have medical coverage, but don't have pharmaceutical coverage. So maybe they can't do the tablet, even if they wanted to. And skit immunotherapy is their only option if they want to do a type of immunotherapy. I think our bigger problem is not necessarily having this discussion, but trying to get, because majority of the people who need immunotherapy don't even get it offered. So trying to get it offered to the people who actually need immunotherapy for any type of immunotherapy, I think it's more important to realize that we can modify disease and that immunotherapy is a viable option. One of the biggest barriers to implementation is arranging um, you know, that initiation of slit tablets you know, in that 12 week window before the expected onset of grass or ragweed season. So, you know, when I'm seeing patients in the office, uh, I'm oftentimes seeing them at the tail end of their problem season, you know, at the tail end of the, of the grass pollen season or the tail end of ragweed. So, you know, we're not thinking about starting that day, you know, we're, we're planning for the next season. And so, you know, that lag time between the initial visit and the first dose follow-up can lead to a high attrition rate. So, you know, it's, it's, it's in this, I think, gets to some um, questions that we're gonna talk about in, in the next section. But, you know, we provide patients with detailed information on the preferred start date and really try to schedule their 30 minute appointment, their 30 minute observation visit the same day they come into the office. So it's kind of locked in, ready to go and shows up on their calendars. So, you know, in addition to that, we also try to you know, leave a recording and have a list of potential grass and ragweed slip candidates on hand so that nurses can reach out to them before that 12 week window uh, occurs. So those are some, some ways we've addressed uh, the, the barriers that were mentioned earlier uh, and getting these patients on, on, on appropriate treatment uh, early on and, and consistently. And I think uh, important to recognize with regard to this issue of when you start the pollen tablets is that really our most compelling data is the Durham uh, study which uh, gave these grass tablets uh, continuously over a three-year period of time and then looked at what happened in the following two years uh, with regard to persistence of benefit. And that study really teaches us that uh, probably the most effective use of these grass tablets is continuous use as opposed to uh, the preseasonal only approach, only be using them for three to four months before the start of the season. I mean, that was the approach taken with the five grass tablets. And while it worked, it didn't show the sustained benefit to the satisfaction of the FDA in the two years after stopping the tablet. So uh, what I tend to do is uh, identify the patient uh, begin the tablets when appropriate, and when appropriate is not uh, in the middle of the pollen season, that's the inappropriate time, but you can begin it really anytime after the end of the season, tell the patient, well, I'll have you come back in when a, whatever season, the grass season, the ragweed season is done, and, and then begin the tablets with the thought, I'm going to continue those tablets uh, at least a year, and with grass three years. And quite frankly, uh, with the others, uh, that's been my policy to continue them for three years. You know, we have new data now from a study done by Glennis Scatting that looked at grass slit tablets versus grass subcutaneous treatment that showed two years of continuous treatment did not yield the benefit in yield three for either skit or slit. And that was a study published about four years ago. So we know that two years isn't enough. Three years seems to be the beginning of where you see a sustained benefit. So I tend to roll these as year round treatment. And obviously the dust my tablet is meant to be uh, a year round treatment. And based on the model of Durham's three year grass study, uh, my tendency is to have the people use them continuously over a three year period of time, at least in order to hopefully see uh, a sustained 
immunomodulation occur consequent to, to the treatment. So I think at this point, we will move on to the patient educational needs. And Dr. Bunsell, uh, please uh, take us in that direction. So you want to give them the background on the slit tablets. You want to talk about how well do we think it's going to work? When is it going to work? How safe is it? What kind of... Um, you know, side effects can I expect with the tablet? Is this short term? Is this long term? What about an action plan? What about, um, you know, you definitely want to review the epinephrine in the clinic and uh, figure out which type of epinephrine you're going to prescribe, train them on it, have them demonstrate that they're able to do it. And I usually advise them to train themselves regularly, you know, just in case there is some type of adverse reaction. Or even though we've talked about don't miss tablets and you have to let me know if you're missing a tablet, um, again, in case they do go the two months and have an adverse reaction. And um, making sure that they have that epinephrine in hand um, is important. Like we make sure that they have it the day of their appointment that they come in. Now I know some places have done it as an office visit. Some places do it as a nurse visit. Some people just do it like immunotherapy where you, you, know, you just have them walk in and you do the training. But in all of these, we make sure that they have everything in hand. I make sure they have their samples in hand. Um, in order for them to be successful and have these tablets. And I also make sure that there's realistic expectations. Um, like I said, just so that we can go into, um, you know, what can I expect and when, and I have solid follow-up set. And I also give them realistic expectations about the approval that we are gonna try our best to get you approved, but you may have X, Y, or Z, which because of X, Y, or Z, which because of that, like it could be your particular insurance or a particular carve out or something in particular, you may not be able to get approved. And if that's the case, then okay, then you can come back and we can talk about other options. Thank you so much, Dr. Monsell. So I'd like to open it up to uh, our panel for any final comments about uh, slit tablets, how to employ them, what the issues are, what the safety and efficacy concerns may be. So uh, Dr. Rawi, Dr. Bunsell, please. I really believe the pandemic has kind of slowly changed patients' views on how healthcare can fit into their everyday lives. So we've seen an accelerated shift of patient behavior towards really accepting digital solutions for addressing their healthcare needs. And our office has seen a significant uptick in patients requesting not only telemedicine visits, but home treatment options. And while of course this isn't a telemedicine based topic, um, it really speaks to the growing trend of convenience taking center stage in healthcare. Uh, millennials and younger patients really want treatment approaches that can adapt to their busy lifestyles. Uh, and this is a niche that products like SLIT and biologic auto injectors can really take advantage of moving forward. And at least in my opinion, I think that if we don't embrace this new paradigm, uh, our patients will tend to seek uh, treatment elsewhere. So I think this is an important point to think of when, when deciding on you know, maintaining the status quo or trying something new. I do feel like we have to embrace all types of therapies and, I, and be a leader and be in the forefront because immunotherapy is so underutilized across the board. And there's so many patients whose quality of lives can be drastically improved and their disease um, progression actually drastically modified uh, by doing some type of immunotherapy versus just um, continually taking medication to mask their symptoms. So I feel that this enhances our treatment repertoire. This lets us um, be engaged with the patient and have them really understand that we are looking out for their best interest and we're there to to work with them no matter what option they decide because we generally want to make them better, but not just better for now, better for years. So uh, so yeah, that would be my perspective into why I have embraced and why I'm using um, sublingual immunotherapy tablets as well as subcutaneous immunotherapy. In summary, slit tablets allow us to expand our use of immunotherapy, not at the expense of SCIT, but in addition to SCIT, for those patients who need allergen immunotherapy, but otherwise wouldn't be receiving it.
In the United States, there are four FDA approved slit tablets, including grass, Timothy, ragweed pollen, five grass, and dust mite, all except which you're buying approved for ages as low as five years of age. The answer is, and we ask you please to submit your answer. And the, uh, the correct answer to this, all of the following which are approved as low as five years of age, the only one that's not approved uh, for five years and above is the dust mite. So that's uh, the correct answer to that question. Next, uh, in clinical trials evaluating the short ragweed slit tablet, numerical trends suggested which of the following versus placebo? for polysensitized versus monosensitized subject. And uh, the slide actually shows uh, what uh, people are answering, greater treatment effect in polysensitized versus placebo than monosensitized. And so uh, that's the actual answer. Next. In two trials evaluated adverse events at any points after treatment interruption of two or more consecutive days for any reason. Treatment emerging adverse events go to 29% of patients receiving house dust mites slit tablet, 26% receiving placebo. At what percentage of house dust might slit tablet patients did adverse events include systemic reactions, need for epinephrine, severe local swelling? And the answer is. Uh, the actual answer is uh, zero percent. None of the subjects had systemic reactions, need for epinephrine, or severe local swelling after uh, reintroduction of the slit. Studies have demonstrated slit tablets can have significant effect by long-lasting symptom relief patients, but to achieve disease-modifying effect, data has shown treatment must be continued for a minimum length of, and the answer, some people thought two years. No, it is three years. It's the minimum length uh, for a slit uh, to give a long-lasting effect. Uh, two years was uh, explored in the scanning study and didn't give a long-lasting effect. Three years uh, was explored in a Durham study and did. So uh, that is the correct answer, three years. So uh, we now have gone through the uh, post-test polling questions. There are questions that have been asked uh, by the audience that we'll address now. Uh, question, does data exist to support monoallergen treatment for polysensitized patients instead of polyallergen preparations uh, from European experience or skit literature? So questions. Data to support monoallergen treatment for polysensitized patients instead of polyallergen preparations. And uh, what we know is that the grass tablets, uh, the ragweed tablets, the dust mite tablets, all were studied in the US in polysensitized individuals and they worked. Now, for grass and ragweed, they studied response during the grass and ragweed season. So even though these people were polysensitized, they got a response, and polysensitized people responded just as well as monosensitized people. And in fact, in the one ragweed analysis, the polysensitized subjects responded better. I'm not going to say that's the norm, but at the very least, they respond just as well. Uh, the dust study done in Europe uh, showed that through the grass and tree pollen seasons, those individuals who are polysensitized but only treated for dust did better than those people uh, treated with placebo during the grass and tree pollen season, suggesting that treating one allergen alone, in this case dust, in polysensitized people actually improved symptoms not only during the so-called dust season, which was the dead of winter, but also through these people's tree and grass season. And the belief here is that dust is actually contributing to symptoms year round, not just during the winter dust season. And if you treat the dust mite component of their disease in polysensitized people, 
uh, their symptoms during their respective tree and grass seasons will improve because you've taken out the dust component of those symptoms in these polysensitized people. So but that's what we know. Uh, treating one allergen works. We're not saying it does anything for the other allergens in terms of specific allergen-driven response, but we're saying when there is concurrent sensitization to multiple allergens, treating one will work, and will work not only during its respective season, as is the case for pollen, but for dust, which is present all year round, will work all year round, even during the concurrent tree and grass season. So that's, that's what we have. We can take it from there. Obviously, we'd like to know more about can you use multiple slit tablets and gain efficacy? We don't know that. We have safety data showing you can use grass, ragweed simultaneously and then safe. But is there additive efficacy as you combine multiple tablets? We don't, we don't have that data. And that's data we're all waiting for. And as you all know, the data with regard to skip and polysensitization, you know, you got to go back to the 1960s. Doug Johnson did a study looking at using our typical multi-allergen concoctions and showed that it helped in kids who had allergic rhinitis and asthma. It's wonderful, but, you know, it's never been rigorously studied, even though, quite frankly, we all do it. And so let's, let's be honest. We don't have... Uh, data looking at polysensitized people treated with multiple allergens in a rigorous way. We got skit studies looking at grass, skit studies looking at ragweed, skit studies looking at dust mites, but we don't have any skit studies other than something going back to the 1960s uh, <laughs> looking at our concoctions of allergens that we all use in clinical practice. So quite frankly, we're all sitting there off label and we're each as guilty as the next in, in terms of what we do being not really vigorously supported by the literature. So that's that's the reality. Any thoughts from my colleagues here on this issue? And you, you stated everything very well. And, and again, I think it goes back to that analogy of that immunologic bucket. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of us use that uh, in our daily clinical practice, but that's the basic concept that we're referring to is you know, if you can if you can take some water out of that bucket, uh, you, you prevent that overflow with the other allergens. So the dust mite is a good example of that. Take that out of the bucket, remove that from 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 you know building up, and, and you can really affect long term care and, and those polysensitized patients. So um, yeah, the, the data looks good, and 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 of course anecdotally we we see that in our offices as well. As well. And then, frankly, like in, um, like you said, in the European model, they do this quite a bit, right? Where they're using monotherapy. It's a very U.S. thing to, um, to like you said, use and mix all of these antigens. So there definitely is, uh, going back to their question, you know, quite a bit um, of experience uh, in the European model using um, slit tablets quite a bit more than we do, and they do do more monotherapy than we do, and um, obviously with good results over there as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, the Europeans look for what they call the dominant allergen. And uh, my European colleagues believe that we only need a few allergens. And uh, right. we can strip this down to maybe we only need birch tree pollen. Maybe we only need Timothy grass. You know, ragweed is not native to Europe. Uh, the United States introduced ragweed to Europe and it's spreading uh, from Eastern Europe and the Southern Russia now into Central Europe. So they, they weren't even used to treating it. Uh, years back, uh, the French Jean Bousquet did a lot of work with Alton area, showing that there are some people who are highly sensitized to Alton area that respond to immunotherapy. But my European colleagues will say, well, you, you know, dust mite, cat dander, maybe Alton area, Timothy grass, bird fawn, that's maybe all you need. And, uh, uh, so they look at this in a very stripped down fashion. And maybe we could add cockroach, and of course, dog. But bottom line is that uh, there is a belief that uh, many of these allergens, especially the tree pollens, the grass pollens, really, and, and our weeds uh, cross-react. And, you know, the grasses essentially all cross-react you know, with some uh, lesser cross-reaction on the southern grasses versus northern pasture. Uh, the birch family includes a lot of the cross-reactive trees we commonly see, and even those that don't completely cross-react, partially cross-reactive. 
nicely in that study that you showed with regard to treating for a birch and looking at what happens in hazel and alder. So, um, in Europe, they feel that they probably don't need everything we use here in the U.S. You know, and, and then I can argue the converse. You know, I look at what we're doing in Washington, D.C. I just personal experience. Uh, we have uh, about 40 allergens, actually we have 48, that we, we test for. So theoretically, you could get a concoction of vial ones, tree grass, weed, and dander. Vial two is mold, dust mite, cockroach. You could be getting administered 48 different allergens. Wow. How does that work? Well, it may work because we're accidentally taking advantage of cross-reactivities. Right. And, and these tree pollens are so cross-reactive that even if we're using 20 different trees in our extract, the bottom line is the cross-reacting antigens are essentially giving us what we need in the end. And the same happens with grass, the same happens with weed. So uh, we're, we're actually working in spite of ourselves. We probably don't need most of what we're using. And we're probably gaining most of the benefits based on a cross-reactive antigenicity as opposed to needing each and every what the uh, uh, bottom line is i think we're going to be streamlining things over time and i think the tablets if anything have taught us something and they've taught us that we can get by with a lot less you know the europeans have had the commercial debate five grasses versus timothy grass bottom line is the five grasses highly cross react timothy grass cross reacts with all of them uh, you, you probably only need one grass uh, in terms of what you're doing and it may turn out as as the birch model is brought to the U.S. or even brought to Canada. Canada is obviously different. The further north you go, the more birch dominance you see. But uh, if birch works in the U.S. by and large, it may be that the cross reactivities will show that you don't need multiple trees, and maybe birch is all you need in terms of getting most of the effect. And we know that short ragweed essentially accounts uh, for weed and allergic subjects, even though there's one word out there and people have been worried about artemisia for years and maybe all you really need is emperor. The dust tablets are interesting. Derp P1, Derp, one Derp P2, Derp two, and equal concentrations, elegantly designed. But again, you know, even though they're elegantly designed, we don't really know that you, you need to even do that because a high amount of cross-reactivity between those uh, uh, Ders, uh, dust mine allergens. So, uh, Cross-reactivity is the name of the game, and we probably could get by with a lot less than what we typically use, and I think eventually we will, uh, as we learn more uh, from this, and we'll, we'll eventually be not making the sort of soups we're making. And that's probably best for our patients. You know, look at the problem. A patient transfers one allergist to another, uh, and then, you know, you got to send out the injections. The other guy can't duplicate what you got. He uses different allergen sources. She uses different allergen source. If we streamline things, it would be much more replicable and it would be less of an issue as people move around the country. So I think eventually we'll be having kind of pharmaceutical grade products, everything standardized and a lot more streamlined in terms of what we do. My one man's opinion. We'll see. Uh, next question. What adjustments do you make for slip patients that have an asthma exacerbation? Any thoughts uh, from you guys? For, for us um, in general, you know, we counsel them at the very beginning because I think uh, trying to educate right when you first have that patient is extremely important because otherwise, um, you know, people have a tendency to do a little bit of whatever, you know, whatever, oh, well, it's just like any of my other pills, right? It's like my blood pressure pill or my diabetes pill, you know, and they don't realize that you could potentially uh, get into a more severe exacerbation. So technically, we say that you, um, if you have any oral sores or anything in the mouth, you know, you if you have dental surgery, we want you to hold it during that period of when um, you're having any kind of oral lesion. By the same token, if you're having an asthma exacerbation, we would like you to hold it during the asthma exacerbation. And then I, in an ideal world, you would call to restart it. I know um, a lot of patients have stopped and started and they feel comfortable doing that at home. So my thought is just to preempt that because you assume that that is probably going to happen at home is to go ahead and tell them that if you do restop and restart it, then you expect to have some local, going back to having some of those local reactions the longer the period is that you are stopping it. Um, because in the PI, it does say, you know, if it's more than a day, you are supposed to contact us. 
but I know sometimes the patients, um, they may not contact us. So at least giving them the advice that you do want to be prepared and obviously have your epinephrine and not do, I just tell people don't add fuel to the fire. You know, if your body's already in trouble, there's no point to be doing that. So um, just like you wouldn't want to administer subcutaneous immunotherapy during an asthma flare, it, it would be the same exact concept. So I don't know if Justin has anything. No, I agree with that. And, and, and I think preemptively, even before that happens and that asthma exacerbation occurs, you know, screening patients for asthma prior to starting SLIT is very, very important or any immunotherapy, whether it's OIT, SKIT or SLIT, um, because maximizing asthma control and really any allergic condition uh, in addition to the, to the SLIT therapy is very important because you want to prevent these exacerbations from occurring in the first place. One of the biggest risk factors for bad outcomes with, uh, you know, SLIT and SKIT reactions is poor asthma control. Uh, so, so having that conversation beforehand, getting those pulmonary function tests and really making sure that you're tracking those uh, consistently over time. Uh, our policy in the office is at least yearly PFTs um, just to track that. Uh, and if we see any dips or any changes, we always do ACTs, we do peak flows. We're really pretty consistent with that. It's easier to do with SKIT when you're seeing them in the office regularly. Uh, but but having that, uh, that that close contact and making sure patients know how serious asthma is with regards to these therapies is really important. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, our SLIT patients, just like our SKIT patients, uh, have an understanding that they need to continue their asthma treatment. Now, the, the SLIT studies allowed mild to moderate asthma in the United States, so it allowed you to be on up to a medium dose of inhaled authority. Uh, human nature is such, people begin to feel better with the slit and then they begin to reduce medication utilization. What we don't want them to necessarily think about even is reducing asthma medication. It's one thing to reduce nasal steroid use. It's another thing to reduce antihistamine use. I don't want them to reduce inhaled corticosteroid or inhaled corticosteroid combination therapy use. And I, we want to emphasize that asthma remains the number one risk factor uh, in terms of immunotherapy and, and, and anaphylaxis, and for skid at least, immunotherapy and fatal events. Uh, now, thank God, knock on any wood you can find, we don't have reports of fatal events with slit tablets. So, I mean, that's, that's the really good news is that slit tablets uh, seem to have a great, greater safety. But the, most of the studies have only looked at mild to moderate asthma. The next question asks, does current data on allergen immunotherapy uh, predict potential use of allergy immunotherapy with uncontrolled or severe asthma? The answer for uncontrolled, no. <laughs> we don't want immunotherapy and uncontrolled asthma. Uh, for more severe asthma, it's being looked at. And it's being looked at as a potential way to reduce therapy in severe asthma, to safely enhance some of the parameters, including nocturnal awakening, albuterol utilization, even lung function and more severe asthma. But the current labeling in the United States is mild to moderate because that's what we've done. Most of the, the studies that have gone into a little bit more severe disease have been European studies as opposed to American studies. So I just give you that caveat that uh, severe asthma is out of bounds for most American insurers. And if uh, they audit your record, which by the way, they probably will, uh, on your slit tablets and they see words like uncontrolled or severe, they will stop covering the slit tablets. I've actually had this happen uh, on a patient who was now well controlled and now not so severe, but they went back through the last three years of records and they saw that at one point he wasn't so well controlled and he was more severe in his presentation but now on therapy, he isn't, but that didn't matter. They saw the word severe and uncontrolled in a record and they pulled the slit uh, tablet authorization. So, okay, the labeling is what the labeling is and it's not supposed to be used in severe or uncontrolled asthma. And until, for uncontrolled, I don't think we're ever gonna get there. Uh, for more severe, we may get there in terms of use of this therapy. We need more literature. Uh, again, what we know from the current studies that we talked about for grass, ragweed, and dust mite, they allowed people with mild to moderate up to medium dose inhaled steroid into those studies. Right? So uh, they were not on high dose inhaled steroid, high dose inhaled steroid combination therapy. That would be characteristic of severe disease. So severe, not yet, could be. Uncontrolled is not going to happen. Uh, any thoughts from you guys? What do you think? 
on a, on this issue. Again, harkens back to what I referred to earlier. You know, again, we're very, very leery about starting immunotherapy in any patient with uncontrolled or severe asthma. So it's something we, we, uh, we, we're careful about. But again, as you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of asthmatics that are allergen induced, and and immunotherapy can be helpful to prevent those types of triggers. So it's difficult to to, to balance that and, and and create a safe environment where patients can get good control of their asthma while on treatment. So it, it, as you mentioned, more literature is needed and. Um, and it's it's definitely, of course, um, not indicated for those definitely those uncontrolled patients. Yep. Uh, frequency of follow up uh, for patients treated with tablets. Uh, my policy has been I see them back in a month, mainly to make sure that the insurance has kicked in and that they really are taking it. I, you know, that first month or two, as you heard uh, uh, from uh, our discussion today, really is where a lot of dropout happens in the slip tablets, really initially. Uh, so I think a month is a good time. Then I like to see them every three months. Why? Just to make sure everything's going well. No problems have happened. No, you know, the biggest problem I see is insurance checks. And this is a nightmare because, you know, you get them improved with one insurance. They change job or they, they change, they get a cheaper insurance. That's the usual one. And the next thing you know, the things aren't being covered. You, you're going back to the, the war. Uh, trying to get them approved, and they go, they give you a list, and they, they failed every antihistamine you can think of, they failed every nasal steroid you can think of, and oh, no esophageal issues, no, 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 oh, I see some reflux, could it be eosinophilic esophagitis, and they had another reason to exclude, so I mean, they look for every possible, they look to make sure there's never been an EpiPen prior to the slit tablet, you know, in the slit tablet studies in the U.S., we excluded people who had ever used an EpiPen for anything before. So if they find somebody's got uh, a shrimp allergy and they got an EpiPen, a bee sting allergy, they got an EpiPen, uh, they may suddenly knock them off from coverage because those people were excluded from the slit tablet study. Why were they excluded? Because we're afraid somebody would anaphylax from something else <laughs> during a study and then the tablet would get blamed. So we, we excluded those people. But then, that's the reason why people uh, can be removed from cover. So think about all that uh, uh, in terms of those uh, issues. Um, I wanted to comment a little bit on the follow-up a little bit more. So for me, um, you know, like I said, that I agree with you that the one-month follow-up is extremely important. Um, but in addition to insurance issues, it's extremely important as well because of um, compliance, right? So because of all those symptoms that they may get, like the oral pruritus or the, or like, you know, just the itchy ears or something else. And sometimes it's just talking it through with the patient. And I do think some of those insurance hassles, you know, they're very regional. Um, for us in Illinois, I don't have that kind of pushback as of yet. I mean, again, knock on wood, um, in terms of the epinephrine and the asthma, um, we have not had that trouble. In Illinois, the main trouble has been that they want uh, an antihistamine and they would like you to have tried nasal spray. And usually there's two. So a lot of times I make sure that I have my ducks in a row when I prescribe it because I know that's what the insurers in Illinois are looking for. Luckily, I don't have the pushback on the asthma angle as of yet, and I don't have the pushback on the epinephrine angle. Um, my other follow-up besides that one month, I do... And then this is the other thing I want to talk about is it really depends on what type of tablet, right? So if they're doing one of the seasonal tablets, you know, like you said, maybe one, three, and that would be good enough because by the 12 week mark, it should be kicking in. And maybe you want to check them once right when they start. And then once during the season, um, the dust mite tablet, the Odactra, I do check them at one, three, six, and then another six after that. So it'd be one, three, six, and 12. Um, it's very deliberate uh, to ensure compliance because the dust mite tablet, like I said, for me is harder to ensure compliance because it's perennial and sometimes people don't realize how much their symptoms are improving until the winter. So that's a little bit more difficult to keep somebody motivated all through the spring and fall as opposed to, oh, wow, I can tell I'm really not miserable during ragweed season. So I don't need as much follow-up with... Um, the ragweed or the grass tablet in my clinic personally, I probably need just the two. And then usually we just bring them in yearly for their start. Unless they're on perennial therapy, then I might add an extra check in there. Um, 
but that's kind of how I divide it up. I divide it based on the tablet. And I also, obviously, we know our patients, right? So we know which ones are more likely to be compliant, which ones are less likely to be compliant, and, you know, kind of working with them to figure out where their comfort level is with the tablet. So thanks. Any other thoughts, Justin? you have any idea uh, in terms of what you, you like to do? Uh, it, it mirrors what, what we're doing in our offices as well. I think that's yeah, great. I think that the important thing is come up with some strategy you know, that, that makes sense. And don't just leave them hanging out there after you've started it with the idea of I'll see you next year. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, whatever you, you, you feel most comfortable with. Again, I, I, I usually see them in a month and then I will see them periodically. And by periodically, choose every three or four months uh, just to see, especially making sure one of those times is during the following season. I think, I think telemedicine appointments, especially, is helpful for this patient population. I think it's a nice yes. uh, follow up. So we, we've used telemedicine a lot in, this, in, these, in these patients. Yeah, so I think it's just important to make sure you have a regularly scheduled follow up and uh, you continue to, to work with them. Uh, any other questions now from our audience? It uh, looks like we, we've, we've satisfied most of the unmet needs here. So uh, I, I at this point, hopefully everyone has a greater appreciation of the use of slit tablets, uh, the efficacy of slit tablets, uh, the safety of slit tablets, and the fact that we now have pretty confidently use them from about five years of age and up with the exception of dust mite, which is uh, still getting that literature together down to five years of age. Safety is pretty remarkable. Most of the adverse events you see are local events, and most of them occur in the first 30 days, after which point, even if you have an interruption of one or two weeks, you can usually restart them at home uh, with adverse event profiles, similar to the initial profile, but events in general much less frequent. And uh, the efficacy is pretty impressive. I think these are some of the, the, the most uh, a robust studies we have for allergen immunotherapy uh, showing that the grass, uh, dust mite, and ragweed products uh, have a very uh, consistent efficacy when used in a tablet format, uh, a very nice safety profile, and uh, can give you long-term benefits after uh, uh, three years of continuous use. So hopefully everyone is more uh, confident in the use of sublingual immunotherapy at this point and uh, more confident in terms of both the efficacy and safety profile. So I'd like to thank Pry and Justin for uh, their wonderful contributions on this program. I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today. I want to thank uh, Integrity CE uh, for developing uh, this program. I want to thank the unrestricted educational grant that was received uh, to Integrity CE from ALK uh, Bell Pharmaceuticals for the development of this program. And want to thank uh, Brian and Justin for their contributions, which are really valuable in terms of providing insights with regard to their employment of both SLIT and SKIT in clinical practice. So thank you all, and thank you for attending.